you go down. Thank you. This is kind of a sudden surprise. Well, it's a... Uh, thank you, everybody said that. <laughs> thank you very much. I was enjoying those songs. My, I like to hear that. You know, I, I love good singing. And I hear plenty of it when I come down here. Usually I'm not... When I come down having healing services or something, I have to kind of stay alone by myself. And then the boys get these tapes. And then when I get home or have some work to do in the office, and I sit down and listen to those tapes over and over. And I hear everything is said. And I'm glad to see Brother Herholz are here this morning, an old friend of the gospel that uh, many years ago was out in this same work praying for the sick, perhaps years before I ever knew about praying for the sick. And so another man here, personal friends, I see a great host here last night from the Tabernacle up at Jeffersonville. And uh, so we're very glad, and I met Brother Young Brown. I said, Brother Jack said his name was Young, and it fits him. When he told me he was 60-something years old, I could hardly believe it. He hasn't changed a bit since the first time I heard three four that's him. Just looks the same. Well, God is good to us. And I, I like those, the way them songs this morning with, with a depth to it. With something that's real. Something that, that, that means something. You can drink it in. I, I could hardly refrain from crying right out loud when I heard them singing that song about, something about the 23rd Psalm there. And then, then come over in this lovely song that they just sang the trio there. Just to think of the, the something in it that you feel on the inside of you, your emotions pulsating, knows that the kingdom of God is near at hand. All these things that we've talked about and wondered about is now fixing to take place. Some of us may fall asleep before that time comes, but that will not prevent uh, our resurrection because it gives uh, the privilege of coming before those are changed. Trumpet of God shall sound the dead, and Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. Do you notice the order of the resurrection shall be caught up together with them? We meet each other before we meet Him. Be caught up together to meet them, with them, to meet the Lord in the air. See, He's God. And then when He wants to be worshipped, that's what His very nature is, is to be worshipped because He's God. And he knows if we were there, be looking out of the corner of your eyes, see if the other one's there. But, and then it wouldn't be the complete uh, way of free worship when we stand there and, and we know we've met each other first and greeted each other and then stand by him who calls it all. And sing the songs of redemption as Brother Jack has many times made the statement when angels will circle the earth with bowed heads and not know what we're talking about. Because they never been redeemed, but we had to be redeemed. And how many crowning the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? I don't know what to say. I didn't think about saying anything. I just come up here. I guess it's testimony time, <laughs> just to give a testimony. And um, so tonight, the Lord willing, I think I've looked at the little schedule and I, for the this services. I think I'm to bring my message tonight on the Easter, or pardon me, Thanksgiving message tonight. And then um, we want to take then the, perhaps the rest of the week, if the Lord willing, and praying for the sick. We want to gather out after this little jubilee of uh, Thanksgiving, which is a memorial of a great meeting that was held here one time at Shreveport a few, about three years ago when you had this a revelation of coming in and the Lord did bless so mightily here in that meeting. And I, I trust that the Lord will continue and may there be souls saved here until the last names on the book. And God's great recording uh, station on, on how those who have accepted Christ as Savior been filled with His Spirit. Now, let's just bow our heads a moment. I'm thinking of a scripture here. Lord Jesus, we are most grateful people this morning, but yet we're just limited with uh, uh, expression. 
if our hearts could give away to what we what we want to, uh, we don't know how we would behave ourselves. And there are no wonder you said there will not be room enough to contain the blessing that God would pour out upon us. And we're grateful for this. And we just pray, Lord, as we bow our heads in adoration of you, that you will receive our thanksgiving. There's so many things that we have to be thankful for, and we could not express them, but we just say, thanks be to God. Above all things that we're thankful for is that great gift of God to the world, and when God gave his Son to make a way for our redemption. We're so grateful for that. And we embrace that and have since, Lord, I can remember since a little boy, that's what I've lived for. And now as I'm getting old, know that the sun will just set up not many more times till I'll be summoned. And what I've lived for, I'll go to enjoy. I know, Lord, that there's many fellow citizens of the same kingdom that waits likewise this morning for that time to come. For that which we have taken the journey for to serve him and to try to direct our fellow man to a, a life eternal. That great hour is soon approaching. We can just somehow feel it down in us that it's, it's near than maybe we are able to think. And we pray that you'll bless us now and continue with thy blessings that thou has been given us this morning. And now as we read a portion of thy word or a verse or two, we pray that the great Holy Spirit will take these verses and a testimony to his honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I thought of a place here, uh, I believe it's found in, a, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, the 14th verse and 15. By their prayers for you, which long after you for exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Paul here speaking of uh, the grace of God that's in you, the unspeakable gift of the Holy Spirit that dwells among the people. He was thanking God for what? That they had uh, the Holy Spirit had come upon these people, the unspeakable uh, gift of God, so rich and pure. Now, I, I don't have nothing uh, in my mind exactly, so I thought I'd just uh, kind of give a little testimony of my experience with Christ in the last few days. It's been most glorious. All my life, you know, you've heard me, many of you, and I thought I'd say this for some of the tabernacle people that's sitting here. That, uh, my congregation of the tabernacle is made up from about three nations of a morning when we speak. Mexico, Canada, United States, Premier Every Here the other day, there was 28 different states for one little Sunday school service. 28 different states represented. I want to say this to the glory of God and traveling. I think that through prayer and supplications, being an off-cast as we were, rejected by the church world as so-called today, that tabernacle has grown into the mightiest headquarters of God's grace of any place known in the world. Amen. I've never seen such as the Lord doing there. It's just, it's unspeakable how what He's doing there, just in humility, just the people coming in from everywhere. And... We're grateful for that little station uh, of, uh, where some of the people around the country gather in to uh, enjoy the grace and, and spread grace to the others. Now, all my life it seemed I wanted to go west, and many of you have read the stories and hear the tapes. The tape ministry is a worldwide thing everywhere. I think it's one way God has got scattered in the message back into the heathen lands, back in where they... It has to be translated into Germany and so forth. They got tapes. They go to their congregations of hundreds and hundreds of people. and put uh, little things in their ears and run it onto a tape. And just as I'm speaking, the minister stands there making the same expressions in, in the other languages and brings it out before hundreds. And hundreds are being saved and healed just through the tapes going out across the world. All in English, but being translated in many, many different languages and tribes around the world. We hear from them back through the mail. 
And uh, I'm saying this, it's going to be a personal testimony uh, to the ke- glory of God, that it might be that you'd understand in the coming nights of what I, I want to say, if the Lord willing, you'll understand. Like I was trying to say last night, uh, the world coming to a place that's falling apart, politically, socially, economically, uh, you say economics, more money. Yes, but where's it coming from? We're borrowed on taxes that will be paid 40 years from today. She's broke. She's bankrupt. The nation. Not this nation, but all of them. And there's no way ever getting it back. And it's a trap set exactly to swing this nation into something. And all of you are wise on that. Well, who's got the wealth of the world? Who holds it? Sure it does. Rome holds it. And whenever we do, when we get broke, instead of these big merchants, tobacco, whiskey, and so forth, like, have to get the money, what will they have to do? Either change the currency or borrow the money. And when they do, it's the birthright, soul right back exactly, just as perfect as just what the scripture says about it. I like to get a place sometime, Lord willing, when a temp comes on the scene, and I believe that's soon now, it's soon going to worldwide. I got a worldwide meeting's coming now. And I, I like to get a place where I can sit down for about six weeks and just take those things and go through them, you see, back and forth through the Scripture. And it's astounding to see the hour that we're living in. It frightens me. Yeah. It frightens me not because it, in my heart the joy bells are ringing knowing that the coming of the Lord is so close at hand, but what frightens me is to know that so many is unprepared for the hour that we're facing. That's the bad part. How many of you ever heard the story about the squirrels up at that time? Man, oh, of course, I guess everywhere. A little something like that happened the other day, and I was. You've heard the story about the mountains coming down when the Lord wrote those things on the mountains the other day. My my life. I'm not a preacher. Anybody knows that. I'm not a preacher, but it's made up in a, a spiritual form of of watching things and seeing things move and forewarning people of things that's coming to pass. And it's just, that's my makeup. I can't help that no more than you can help your makeup. But God has put us each one in the body to do certain things. And I watch every little move, every objective, every motive, because everything is governed by, governed by spirit. This church was put here for a purpose. There's a spirit behind this church. Certainly, spirit behind your home, behind every building, behind everything. There's a spirit, motive and objective. This church comes here to... Um, greatly exalt some human system or something, then its motives is not right. But if it's put here to try to achieve something for the kingdom of God, then the motive and objective both is right, if the motives is directed that way. Now, I've been thinking since the ministry and the first, second, and third phase of the ministry, when I first come to Shreveport, I told you people that the Lord, you lay your hands up like upon my hand and it would signify the same and the Holy Spirit never fail one time but I told you exactly what was wrong with you I told you then that the, he told me that day that there would be a time that when you know the very secret of the heart not knowing that the word says that will be I didn't know that but the word does say that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart Hebrews the fourth chapter now That word, you see, you must never lead that word. You must stay exactly with that word the way it's written. Don't put no private interpretation to it. Just say it just the way it's written. That is God's word. And that is God. God and His word is the same. Just the same. And as I said last night, there's a portion of word laid for every age. And there's some anointing comes down that projects that uh, portion of word for that age. And you see where we're at today. You read what we're supposed to be doing, and you'll know how far we are. I only see one thing left, the coming of the Lord Jesus. At any time, a rapture for the church, and we're to meet him in the air. Now, these things has got to come to pass in this day, just as he promised they would do it. And now, about five years ago, after that had served its time, each one of those Phases that served his time, and he'd give visions, and many of you tape listeners and so forth know that there was coming one more phase, and he simply drawed that out so perfect. There's man sitting right here now, I'm looking at, was right there and seen it take place. 
as perfect as I ever seen in my life, and even took pictures of it, of what the Lord God said would take place. And we went right there and there it was, just exactly like he said. Just about like the March 17th, a uh, March issue of the Life magazine, you've seen that circle of light in the skies, 30 miles high, 27 miles across. Well, moisture's only about nine miles high, and they can't even make up what it was. And right standing beneath that, a man is sitting right present now was right standing there by me when seven angels come down from God visibly standing right there and told me about the end time and these revelations and things of the book of Revelations, the seven seals, and said, return home and one by one will bring the message. That, that's right. And it went right up and began to turn white as it went up, on up, and a blast that shook the mountains to rock the size of a, of a, a bucket fell out of the mountains like that. And nothing was around. Even the newspaper said they checked to see if there's a sound break or a plane or something there was nothing no planes up nor nothing and besides a plane breaker could not do that and then it was foretold to be that way six months before it happened six months and there it was in the science searching it today right there in tucson and different places they can't understand what was that up there and then if you'll get the magazine and looking you can see the shapes of their wings is still in there so they're going up the seven angels and we know that these things are correct friends Oh, if there ever was a time that the church ought to be in deep sincerity, it should be right now. Amen. Now, that just it's done something to me I, I, and myself. For five years now, I've wondered what was wrong. I felt in my heart like I was, I was all crushed down with something and I, I couldn't make out what it was. During the time of this great crushing and so forth, I've just... Uh, plastered around and around across the country and the government had me under an investigation because when we have the meeting somebody write a check to William Branham and I just sign it and hand it back and then we got a package of all, the, all of our meetings and when they looked through there and found out that it went into the pay the campaign yet as I signed my name to it I identified the check to myself and they had me I owed the government $300,000 and it, they wouldn't let me leave and I had to stay here and so forth for a great time to search through all of this. And, and uh, I not, everything went, they said, yes, it went into the campaign, but the people made the check to you. And when you endorsed it, you identified yourself with the check and you owe taxes on it. If you never even held it a second in your hands, it's still yours because you endorsed it. I didn't know it. I don't know all the mechanics of this, the uh, laws and things. I was supposed to have a stamp to stamp it instead of sign it. When I sign it, it means it's mine. And then they cut right into the package and find there it was placed right into the fund and spent out like that. I draw a salary from a church of $100 a week. There sets a trustee sitting right there that knows that's right. And that's all I get from that. And I, uh, otherwise, it goes right into the campaign. Now, I felt like I was crushed for the last four or five years. Well, I went up into Canada just recently on a little trip of going hunting. And what I did... The Lord helped me up there to lead a whole tribe of Indians to the Lord Jesus. And I had to go back when the, when the, well, the creek stopped up, up there and things to baptize the whole tribe in the name of the Lord Jesus because the healing of an Indian woman dying in a heart attack that the priest wouldn't come to. Way back in the jungles where I had to ride for hours horseback. There are those sitting here now who was present uh, when it happened. And now, then coming down, I had to stop over in Colorado to visit some of my friends there, some ministers, and I'm a, I'm a guide in Colorado, and I was taking them on a hunting trip. Two or three of those men, three, four or five of them are sitting right present now to know this. And it's been awful dry in Colorado this year as it has been a, across the nation. And fires were very, going to be very bad, so they delayed the hunting season a while. But while we were up there, there come forth an issue that... That there was coming a blizzard, and it's dangerous to be in the mountains at that time because you, sometimes I've seen you couldn't even see your hand before you for hours after hours, and 30 foot of snow dump right out in one time. Just in a few hours right on top of you, you perish. So I told my brethren that morning when we was leaving out, I said, now the blizzard, practically a hundred men or more have been back and behind us, and here come jeeps, trucks, and everything going right on out because they know what was going to happen. No one left back but the cowhand himself back there, which he winters back there. And we were the only couple, or only truck that stayed in. And I asked the brethren, they said, we'll go to state. So then, all right, 
I said, now be ready. And we went out and got some, a Methodist minister and I went and got some more bread and stuff so we could find it. It's about 30 miles in and back. So we come back. Brother John and them sitting here, they heard that and away they went. They got out at the time. So the blizzard struck. But we was going to stay over and I was going to Tucson for a meeting and I called my wife and told her that we had, uh, if I didn't get there to let somebody else substitute in my place. And the next morning we started out, I said, now if the first time is real cloudy, you hear the rainfall or anything, get back to that camp as quick as you can, because within 10, 15 minutes, you'll never see your way back again. And so I had the man placed out and went up over the top of the ridge, walking up, trying to run deer down on them. And I, a few days before that, shooting my rifle in down in Tucson, coming back up there, I'd throw it out a little bit to the right, I shot a big a uh, buck that I've been looking for for many years. And it hit him too high, and I, I, he had died down there, and I couldn't find him. The weather was getting bad. I thought I'd run up and take a look. And then when I got up on top of the mountain, I noticed the rain started the sleet falling and uh, big drops of snow the size of a silver dollar just plastering everywhere and the winds twisting. And I knew everyone was on the run back to the camp then. Well, I waited a few moments, and I thought I'll never be able to find this deer at this time under this storm. So on we went, started down the mountain, just could see about 10 feet in front of me and about, I was about four miles or more to get into the place, knowing I'd come down the mountain, knowing the country so well because of herding cattle there for years and years. Coming down the mountain, I got about a half a mile from the saddle of where I was crossing like this, across the range of where I was at, and there was, uh, I've been feeling that horrible burden. I've cried, I've prayed, I've confessed what can I do? What is it that I've done? Like you've done something real evil. Like you'd hurt somebody. and You know you ought to make it right. What was I condemned about? I knew not. I said, Lord, if you only reveal it to me, I'll make it right. But what have I done to stand and preach and do all that I know to do? And I've tried to live clean, clear, and just according to your words. But what have I done? And still that burden would not let up year after year. I thought about it on the mountain that morning, and I started down. The day before was my anniversary to my wife, and I were married 20 years uh, before that, and I've never been home <laughs> on an anniversary. And I always go up to the mountain, a little place where there's some quaking ass. The first year we were married, I didn't have enough money to take a honeymoon and, for a little trip and then take a hunting trip too, so I took my wife on a hunting trip for the honeymoon. <laughs> so that looked like honey. Getting it, uh, got both at the same time. And I remember a little fella, I, I'd pick her up and lift her over logs and things. And we got up to a little place and I took her picture. And it's always kind of a, a kind of a, a fair. I think of that and think of her black hair and how pretty she was. And now gray and just a few years is done to her. I thought, I believe I'll go up there, but it's, it's too hard. The uh, snow was too hard then. I know I had to get in because it broadcast a severe blizzard on the road. It broadcast across the nation. I don't know where Tom Simpson sat in here this morning. Now, coming down from Canada, he was told by radio not to even go through that country at all. Everybody said, don't go through there, go that way, because a horrible blizzard is sweeping across. And I started down the mountain thinking about that at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, just as plain as you hear my voice, the voice says, stop and turn around and go back. Now, I couldn't tell this amongst people that's unbelievers. You only have to tell it to believers. And then, because it's, un unbelievers will never understand it. You've got to have a spiritual mind to understand spiritual things. The Word is spiritual. It's interpreted spiritual. And it's, uh, it's God's Word. And I stopped and I thought, if I go back up there, another half a mile back up, the storm raging like it is, and David would and made me a, a sandwich, and it was. I think he's getting even with me for making his father one one time. We didn't have nothing but some onions and honey and bread, and I put it all together. We made us a sandwich. And uh, he could hardly eat his. And I think he was trying to get even with me for that, so he put I don't know what all kind of what. And going up the mountain, the rain falling so fast, it got it wet, and it's just one big wad. I thought, well, I'll eat that and wait. While I was standing there, I thought that wasn't nothing. I just imagined as a wind probably was blowing, twisting through these trees. And I started to walk on. I just could not walk. And I thought, well, I, I believe I'll go back. 
And I heard it again. Go back where you come from. It said that. I started up the mountain, stopped, and I thought, maybe I, I, I was getting scared to go back to where it was at because the, the winds were so terrific. Sometimes God makes us do things that it seems very dangerous and out of line. How about Moses with that stick going down to take over Egypt and everything we find like that, that God asks the impossibles, see, so that he does the impossibles. That man will know that it isn't him, it's God that's doing it. I went back up to the top of the mountain again, finding my way through the blowing, twisting trees. And I sat down and tucked my gun and keep the scope and getting up like that bear running that kind of time. And so I put my scope back under my shirt like this and sat down a moment. I thought, what am I doing sitting here? But God works in mysterious ways, His wonders to perform. They're past finding out to the carnal mind. and never catch a glimpse of it. And as I walked back up and sat down, sitting there thinking on God, wonder why I come back. I thought, my time to get to bottom of the hill, that storm getting more terrific all the time, closing in. You couldn't see very far ahead of you. And I, if you don't have to believe this, but this is true. A voice spoke to me and said, I am the Lord God. I created the heavens and the earth. Nature obeys me. And then I sat there a little bit, jerked off my hat. And that voice somewhere, I couldn't see it. Only thing I could hear it is around there in them trees somewhere. I thought, usually you see that light that all of you know about. Usually it's there, but I looked everywhere and I couldn't see the light. I said, where are you, O oh God, my creator? I looked around. I couldn't hear no more. Hear his voice. I waited a few minutes. He said, I am the Lord God that had you to speak those squirrels into existence. And all of you know about that. And so help me for this Bible before me on this Thanksgiving morning. If that isn't true, God may strike me dead at the platform now. See, it's true. He's still just as much creator of God. A God that could provide a ram for Abraham can provide. G still Jehovah Jireh. The Lord can provide. Where did Abraham get that ram? Look, a three days journey from civilization up on top of the mountain where there's no water or nothing. And he had need of a ram. And there was a ram hooked in the wilderness by its horns. And Abraham had went around and picked up rock all around there to make this altar. But God still remains Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide for himself. That whatever he's promised, that he's able to do. That's that word in Matthew there, I mean Mark eleven twenty two. If you say to this mountain, I, I never could understand that. You know the story about that. And so help me, that's true. He said, I am the one that provided that, uh, th them squirrels. He said, now, when he, uh, listen again to see what he would say. Nothing stopped. Wind just howling going on. I, I have to bite myself. Because let me tell you something. Real spiritual minds is one step from insanity. Did you know that? A scientific research will tell you that. Here you are down here, slow and slumpy. Then you come up a little more spiritual. Then you're about like this. Then you go to like a dull axe and then to a horn razor. Now, either which side you fall on there. If a man tries to lift his step up there, he's sure to go on the wrong side. If God lifts him up there, he's far above the average person. Amen. There's where visions and things break through. There's where the kingdom of God is. Poets, prophets, and all were considered neurotics. Jesus himself was called a crazy man. He said, we know you're a mad and got a devil. Mad means crazy. Look at all the poets and, and prophets through the ages have been considered that. That extremely try, try. If you try to pull yourself up there, you're gone. You'll never make it. It takes a hand reaching down from glory to hold you on that edge there between the right and wrong things. And standing on them ages is where you look across into Beulah land. Then on that very hour, it spoke again at that very same time sitting up there. He said, I am the one that stood on the ship that night and made the winds and the waves to cease. He said, rise upon your feet and rebuke this storm. And it'll obey exactly what you say. That's been that third stage of the ministry coming. It's been moving up for years. Look like he's something that keeps worried. I think, oh, don't. But 
That's exactly what he done. And this is him again. It's just exactly his spirit again. Just exactly. But I've had so many carnal impersonations upon the other. It makes me scared to even think about it. Because you'll have that just as sure as the world is always the mixed multitudes and that carnal impersonation has to follow it. It did in his days. It did in Moses' days. It'll do it in every day. It'll do it in this day when the Holy Spirit's trying to do the work. But still, if a person is spiritual, the carnal impersonation only magnifies the right one, the, the, the real article of God. And standing there uh, at that time, I raised up and I said, Lord God, great creator of nature, I believe that that's you speaking. Not one time have you ever showed me anything that was wrong, and not one time have you let me see anything but what come to pass. I said, therefore, I say to this storm that's a raging, go to your places, go back, leave this alone, and I command that the sun will shine for the next four days so these men can get their trophies and get, I can help them get, them get out of these mountains. And the Lord God, who is my solemn judge this morning, that rain and things twisting within a moment's time. There wasn't a bit of it. I looked and there's a wind come from the other way across the top of the mountain and lifted up those clouds like that. Within just a matter of a few minutes, the sun was broke up right to the top and shining right down just as pretty as it could be. Just the same way it did in Germany. You remember the story in Germany when them witches 15 on one side cut, took a scissor and cut a feather pointed it back this way, stood there going through their enchantments and said they'd blow the tent away of 30,000 people and Brother Argan right was standing there and here come the storm and cloud coming right up. Stood there by Brother Louster, many of you know him, the American born, a German here that's my interpreter there and he, he stood right there and said, I said, don't interpret this. I said, Lord God, you give me a, a vision and sent me to Germany. These witches have brought up this storm. You're the God of creation. Let it be known that you're God. No one but what could understand English and that wasn't a dozen there that know what I was speaking about. Just stand the tent raising up like this with 30,000 people beneath it, jumping up and down like that. Settle down and the clouds and thunders roared away in less than five minutes the sun was shining right down through when about 15,000 Germans came to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's still God. He's just as God as much as He ever was. Well, as I stood there on that hill coming out about four days later, anyone here knows the truth. Not one cloud was in the sky from that hour for four days. And I come down and go out, went by gasoline. When we come out of the mountains, I said, it have been pretty dry. I said, yes, it's been dry. I said, I, he said, we're looking for a storm the other day come up, but we don't know the thing stopped. See? I went on down to the other side of Colorado, stopped to get some gas. Billy Paul, my son back there, we were uh, together. I said, let's just see if it stopped down here. I drove in. I said, good morning. So we started talking to the man. He said, good morning. And he, I said, it was sure a beautiful day. He said, yes, the old sun's coming out hot again. So she sure burned us up this summer. I said, hey. I said, well, that's all across the nation. He said, yeah, I understand. Now, I said, it's getting almost time for your storms. He said, you know what? He said, all the papers, radio, and everything else give the storm coming of the day, and the clouds come, and the storm started, and all at once we don't know what happened to it. It all went away. He's still God, just as much God as He ever was. But how can a man say those things unless God tells him first to say it? See, not under impression, but you know what you're saying, then do it. But wait, don't try to say, oh, that's the way many people, I think, and, and gifts of God. Wait to know it's, you know it's God, see? Wait till the voice comes and you hear it, know it, see it. Then you can say, it's thus saith the Lord. If it isn't thus saith the Lord, then it's your impression. It's what somebody else thinks. People request people, say this for me, do this for me. How can you do it if you're honest with God until God first tells you? How can I tell you thus said Jack Moore and Jack Moore hasn't said nothing to me? Amen. It's got to come first from God, not impressed. It's got to be God and then it'll happen. Amen. For it is then thus saith the Lord. Now, everybody won't have that. No, sir, it won't be that way. It never was that way. It never will be that way. God deals with an individual. He did in the days of Noah. He did in the days of, of Joshua. He did in the days of Moses. He's always, he's never made a system. It's been an individual. Because two men ain't alike, no time. See, he never did do no more. But 
Everybody didn't have to be Moses. They didn't understand it. They just followed. And the Holy Spirit, if a man is anointed of God, will direct you to follow the Holy Spirit in the Bible. For he is the one who does these things. Jesus Christ in the form of the Holy Ghost working in the people. Standing there. I started to walk back down. I stood there. I cried. I couldn't help it. To see what had happened right there in a the moment. And uh, the brethren up there. Now how many was uh, Is there somebody here? I know Fred Softman and him is here. Was up there. Uh, no, Fred was with me at the other place. Is there any here now that was up there? Is Brother Banks Woods and them in here yet? Is there anybody here besides uh, Billy Paul that was up there? Uh, these boys had just left. Yeah. And Brother Woods. And um, Brother Taylor. Uh, I forget the other brother's name. Four or five of them were standing there. These brother here, Brother Martin, had just left. Left the day before on the cow the storm coming. You all remember the storm, the broadcast. They said it was coming. Now, what's it? You met it. You met it. Then, um, and I noticed, standing there, I thought, well, I guess I'll go down the hill. And I, I made a vow to God a few years ago, going out with a full gospel businessman, that I wouldn't shoot game for somebody else unless it was an emergency. I just wouldn't do it. And uh, Brother Jack Palmer, is he here? Brother Jack, uh, he's from Georgia. He usually comes to, up here. He was standing there, and the night before, he said, Brother Branham, hit me a deer. And I just shook, because I, I know I vowed I wouldn't do that four or five years ago, because that year I killed 19 head of elk alone, just for them businessmen to sit around and talk their business, I'd have to go out and kill their game. And it just didn't seem like putting put me in a murder case, but I wouldn't do it. I'll take them worse at it, but I won't shoot it. So I promised God I wouldn't do that. So then... Uh, I got, uh, left the place going back, started back down the hill, and a voice spoke to me. He said, why not walk with me? I said, Lord God, if that's you, I know that only the hand of God could part those clouds and do what you've done here in the warm sun shining down, drying my shirt out, the steam coming up from it. And I said, great cathedral, virgin forest, you know. And I said, I believe I'll walk up this way then, Lord, if you have no certain direction. I want to go up there and stand just in a few minutes for a little memorial to my wife of our, of our first and only honeymoon, you know, that we ever had a chance to go and I took her on a hunting trip. And here I am up here this year again, hunting with these brethren and her down in Tucson trying to keep things going. And I started walking down through there and I got to thinking, now this is going to sound very funny and I'll hurry because I know your service starts at about 10 minutes. And so I was walking down along through there, and I was thinking, or oh, wonder why that she never has said a word to me about going anywhere. And this morning, I want to tell you what happened in a few minutes. I, 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 every man ought to think this. I, I think there's not a woman in the world like my wife. She's just a wonderful person. A little pie, stay at home. She's always had my clothes ready, and I'd be out gone on the trips and everything, come in and say, uh, uh, tease her a little bit say I'm your husband or you my wife and like that and kiss the children and kneel down and have prayer and put on my clothes to keep from having to lose my mind nearly from the crowds and things take off and go fishing or hunting away from her she's had to bear it all alone herself then I got to thinking well maybe when I'm home the only thing I'm always the only thing I know is God and His Word and I'm constantly talking to him and I was going along there and a thought presented to me said well, maybe she just lets you go because it, it uh, keeps the people away and so forth like that. And she can be a little more peaceful when you're away. And I begin to accompany that thought. And I went <clears throat> like that. And when I did, I seen the whiskers on my face from about a week old. And they were better than half gray. I thought, Bill, you're just you know, where you're headed. You're headed right on out now. You're getting old. You already crossed that 50 mark. So I was just thinking that, going along with my rifle hanging on my shoulder, walking along like that. And all of a sudden, something happened. It seemed like in every principle, I was a boy again. I don't know what mentally taken place or what it was. And I looked standing in front of her, and there in front of me, and there she stood just the way she was when I married her. I set my gun down to rub my eyes. I looked at her, and she held out her arms like this, looked at me. I bowed my head down because I was going right up there for a little, a little memorial for our anniversary. Stand by those trees, a bunch of little trees up there quaking ass, just like it was 
up in the North Woods when we went up in Adirondack. And I always go up there each um, uh, 23rd day of October when I'm up there. And there she was. Now, I done set my rifle down, looked there. And I stopped a minute and I bowed my head. I looked back and she was still standing there with her arms out. And I thought, I haven't surely lost my mind. I looked again. I thought, why would this be? And here I was, a young fellow. I looked at my hands and I said, I, Lord, my responsibility in the world to bring your message, surely this is something that happened to me. And I looked again and then it just faded away. And I picked up my rifle, put it on my shoulder. And I said, maybe that you let me know that the reason it does break our heart when I have when I come in and go out hunting and things like that. But as I started walking on, I took off my hat again. I said, God, I know that you're here. There's no doubt in my mind but what you're here. And I believe you every word. You, you make that sun shine down on my back. You're the one who does these things. You're a creator. I, I, I've been so dilatory. It looks like I'm afraid to take a hold. I'm afraid I'll, I'll do something wrong. I said, there's one thing I will ask you to do, lift the burden from my heart. There's no need of me trying to confess anymore because for five years I've constantly cried out to you. What have I done? Tell me what it is. And I was walking up the little hill then, right close to where I was going to stand for a few minutes, just to thank the Lord for, for my wife and for a uh, successful marriage that God had given us and the love we'd had for each other these years and our children. I do that every 23rd day of October. And there's a little quake and asp about all oh, 10 inches thick had come up about like this and went out kind of an L and went up. And just as walking up the hill, I got real weak and I just leaned over against that tree like that. Now I could hear something patting on the leaves. Just a minute. Now the leaves had done dry the time I'd walked there about 300 or 400 yards. And I looked and it was water coming from my own eyes, dropping off through the gray beards down onto the ground. I said, Oh God. What a, what a failure I am. And standing there in that condition, I said, I, I trust that you will be merciful to her. I said, I, I ain't worthy to ask for mercy. And I said, someday I know I'm getting gray and I, I got to go, Lord. I, and I guess people think it's crazy, but I, I find God out in them places. That's, that's where it's real to me. I, it, it's just it's as real as it is right here. And um, uh, frankly, a little more so, because she, all of you are part there. It looks like I'm just standing with him alone, talking to nobody but him. And as I stood there, I heard the brush break. And I kind of raised my head up with a red shirt on now and a red band around my, my hat. Red handkerchief wrapped around one of those Western hats. And I, and I looked, and here stood two, three deer standing right by me. Just walked up there. Me and that red, all that shooting over there, a hundred man, they've been shot at 40 times, I guess. Why? Sure, they'd have scattered right now, but they didn't. They just stood and looked at me. And find me two full grown fawns and a big doe. And something said to me, There is a deer for Brother Evans, one for Brother Welch, and one for the Methodist preacher. There's exactly what the Lord God has given to you now. You, they can't get away. There's no way for them to. I had a rifle hanging on my shoulder right here. And before they could even got turned around, I killed all three of them. See? Like that, before they could even move. They were right in my hands. And, I, and I, I thought, there they are, just the three. Easy to roll them right down the hill here and then throw them right on out. And I thought that would be very easy. There's the three. Then we can go home from there, take out, and get out of the mountains. And as I looked at them there, they're standing looking at me just as quietly about 15 yards, 20 well, I just stood still, and uh, I don't know whether you fellows hunt deer or not, but they're odd when they're, they're don't, or we're not certain they'll fix their feet like this, go. And then she, they watch me. I thought, well, there it is. All the thing, you just throw my rifle over, and they, they're gone. And then I remembered, I promised God that I wouldn't do it. I remember that. I thought, no, I can't do it. That isn't right. I promised God that I wouldn't do it. And when you make a promise, you stay with it. God expects you to. 
And there I thought, well, just perfectly in my hands. But yet I promised him I wouldn't do it. I said, go on, mother. Take your babies and go on into the woods. Enjoy yourself. I love this too. You're in my hands, but I ain't going to kill you. And they come a little closer. Oh, how unusual that is for deer. And they look at me, you know, and turn their head. And me stand there dressed in red with a rifle standing in my hand. And they walked real close to they could almost, I could feed them out of my hand. And they just nosed around there a few moments, turned around, walked on back a little piece. They stopped, come back again. Something kept saying, they're right in your hands. They're right in your hands. The Lord has put them in your hands. I said, but I promised. I promised that I wouldn't do it. Since then, I thought, you know, one time David was led right to the very side where Joab was laying. And uh, where uh, King Saul was laying, Joab said to him, said, the Lord has delivered him into your hands. But he said, God forbid that I touch his anointing. See, you must watch when you make a promise. And I said, I promised God that I wouldn't do it, so I won't. I said, Mother, take your children and go on out in the woods. I'm not going to bother you in my hands. You couldn't get away if you had to. But I, I'm not going to hurt you. Go on to the woods. And they come right back again, right around me. And I stood there and I thought, what is this a strange thing? I'm a nature person. I, I, I watch God in nature. The sunset and rise. That the death, the life, the burial, the death, the resurrection again, everything like the trees. How Job said about hiding in the grave and keeping the sacred place and see the sap leave the trees and go down into the grave of the roots and come back up in the spring. The resurrection, everything speaking of life and resurrection. And as I stood there watching, they got closer, closer. Then they turned and walked on out in the woods. And I just stood there, just dumbfounded like. And when they went away, that voice spoke down again, that sun shining on my back. said, you remembered your promise, didn't you? I said, yes, Lord, I remember your, my promise. I know that you, I can't see you, Lord, but you're here somewhere. I said, I don't see you, but I hear your voice. I know you're here. I said, you kept your promise, you remember your, your promise. I remember mine, too. I'll never leave you nor forsake. Oh, my. I haven't felt the same since. I come off the mountain. All the afternoon, vision after vision happened, uh, uh, taking place. I come on down. It seemed like everything's been different since then. Uh, a burden has gone. About... When the ministry first come to me with feeling the, uh, the person's hands, what it was, is a life in them, and, and we know how it went. One night in California, I was uh, sitting with the Malikian family. Uh, Brother Moore remembers Brother Brown, the Malikian family. And the little lady was going to take milk leg from childbirth. And I, I had her put her hand on I said, there it is. Did you see the vibration of it? See? And I said, you're going to take milk leg. I said, it's already working. And she did, almost lost her life. And Brother Malikian said to me, he said, Brother Bram, how do you do that? I said, I don't know. I can't tell you how it is. It's God. And so I held my hand out uh, uh, like that. I said, here, here's my wife. I know there's nothing wrong with her. Lay your hands upon mine, honey. And she did. And there a tumor vibrated from female. And I said, sweetheart, you have a tumor, honey. And the female glands, and she said, I, I feel no effects. I said, sweetheart, here it is on my hand. Raise your hand up. She raised up, and then lay it back down. See it? Well, when we went, come home, we got a very fine doctor friend and went to school with him. We took her down to examination and said, Billy, there's nothing wrong with her. I said, she's all right. No tumor there. I said, Sam, I don't want to doubt your word, see, because you're examined with this tumor there. Everybody over three or four years, when I go to get my physical or when I go overseas, she goes with me for a physical. And when it was... Never seen it. And about two years ago, I come in one day, uh, I, I must tell all truth. See, you don't want to just bypass anything. You must tell all truth. And I've expressed to you my love for my wife. But yet we have to watch in them things. I'm telling you the truth. The Heavenly Father, who is my witness right here now, knows His truth. Oh, at the house, how it is, just this, that, and everything. The poor little thing is going through the change of life at this time, menopause. And for the last couple of years, about two years ago, when we had a physical, then 
the doctor found a tumor on the left ovary. It had grown to about the size of a, of a walnut. He said, let me examine that again, Brother Branham. He said, about three months, the dad goes growing, has come out. Well, then we, uh, but just before that, I've got something to tell you. I forgot that. One day I come in and from the house and I was uh, come in to do something. I turned around and went out and I said, she said, can you go downtown with me, Bill? And I said, not right now, honey. And she said, what are we going to do about Becky? Uh, Sutton? So I said, well, honey, I don't know just what to do. And there's something come up and... Um, she was so nervous she could hardly hold herself together. People at the house all night long, like night before last evening, one o'clock in the morning, here were people in around the house, around the windows and everything. So then she was real nervous and she said something to me snappy that she oughtn't to have said it. See? She said, then, Bill, you're always gone and I have to take care of these children myself. She said, you're never here. We can't make our decisions together. You're either out or gone. And she started crying when they shut the door. Right then, I said, oh, poor little feller. I said, my heart. I started out, and it said, read Second Chronicles 22. It's when Miriam rebuked Moses for marrying an Ethiopian girl. It'd be better that her father had spit in her face than to do this. And I, I went back in, and I said, sweetheart, you said the wrong thing. And she was crying. I said, you said the wrong thing, honey. God's going to make you pay for that. You shouldn't have done that. I'm all tore up myself. You shouldn't have said that. And she said, well, Bill, I get so tore up. And I just turned and walked back because I know she wasn't in the mood to receive it. So I went back out. And the next examination, about a month after that, showed the tumor. Last year, here it come again. When she tried again, now it was up the size of an orange. The doctor said, don't put it off any longer. You must operate that so the fast-growing tumor is malignant. If it gets off that ovary and gets hooked into the side, what are you going to do? I said, doctor, we have faith in God. I never said to the church, and I said, let it go. We started praying. And I said, Lord God, help us, please. I pray you help us. And all night that tumor grew on and on. Then when we left to go to Tucson, our doctor at home sent word to a doctor friend of his there, said, if... You must take this tumor from Miss Branham at once. Said if you don't, it's going to turn malignant. Told him. Said uh, the tumor has already grown within a year from the size of a walnut until the size of about a grapefruit. It had gotten so big. There it was pushed out on her side like that. And the other day, she she put it off going. I said, try. We prayed. We cried. We begged. Everything. Nothing to take place. And then she's going. Had to go last. Let's see. Last, yesterday. Uh, yeah, yesterday she went to the doctor for the final. I said, well, I hate to do it, but we'll probably have to give in. And then, honey, uh, you, you'll just have to, uh, to give in to have, the, have it taken out because it's getting so big. Our faith is not sufficient. So day before yesterday, before I left, Norton, she said, don't call me until after you have Brother Jack's service that night. And then tell me what kind of a meeting you had and how all the people are down in Shreveport. And I said, I'll give you the, uh, what the doctor said. I said, all right, honey. And I hung up. Yesterday, day before yesterday, when I started to leave there in the house, I went in and always when we leave, all the kiddies and all of us get together and kneel around there in the room and pray. And the Lord, uh, uh, we tell the Lord, when I'm going overseas, I say, Lord Jesus, take care of my family. And they pray for me that God will help me and we can meet together again. And then all the kids start crying and things, you know, because... You know how it is. Talk about President Kennedy being shot. I've had to be guarded many times from being shot with an infrared scope. And maybe just three or four hundred yards away at night time. You can see just the same as can daytime through that spotter scope at night. And I've been in Catholic countries where radicals and everything down in Mexico there where they send back there and send word telegram messages, wrote everything. We'll get you tonight and so forth like that. Going in and out and looking for it. And perhaps I will get it sometime. That's all right. But I've got something to take care of me when that time comes. And, and then when I started uh, to leave again just by myself the other day, I knelt down the day before yesterday. And I knelt down in the room. And I looked around. I've been there a couple of days. Lonesome. Nobody there at the house. I said, Heavenly Father, 
I, I pray you be merciful now and help me. I'm going down to Shreveport to do everything I can to help your kingdom. I said, how many times has my wife and I knelt here in the room like this? We prayed, and today I'm so lonesome for her. I said, tomorrow she goes in, and perhaps I'll not be able to finish my meetings because she'll perhaps be taken to the hospital for this great tumor that we've asked you to take away. It's grown and grown, but now it must be taken away. I said, I, I begged to you, and I said, Lord, if she said something wrong when, she, when there I was torn up, if she said something wrong, I said, Lord, just think she's never one time. Not one time has she ever said one thing to me going in your meetings. I said, you, she's always had my clothes clean and ready and hold me by the hand and cry and pray and say, uh, if I could just do something to help the Lord. And I said, look at her condition, Lord. And don't, don't do it. Don't, please don't, Lord. And I, I said, God, help her. I pray that you'll be merciful to her. And if she has to go through that operation... Help her through, Lord. If I lose her, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm an old man. And there are little kids to be raised, and what could I do? Be merciful to her, Lord. You know how I love her. And I said, I, I just pray that you'll help her. And as I was praying, I heard something say, Stand up on your feet. And I just went ahead praying because I, I, I thought maybe I imagined it. And as I prayed on something, said, Stand up on your feet. And I stopped praying, looked up, and the picture of Christ, the one that, I never did care for Selman's picture. I, I like Hoffman's picture, the head of 33, you know. And I've got a big a picture of it because when I seen him in the vision that time, that's just the way he looked. And there it was. I got it fixed so that he'd be looking right at me when I was praying in this picture. And I looked up there and I looked at the picture and looked all around. I thought, what was that? Stand up on your feet. I thought, well, I'll stand up on my feet. And I got up on my feet, just that same voice that spoke up there on the hill that night. Same one that always come. I said, Lord God, was that you speaking to your servant? He said, just say the word. And there will be no more tumor. I stood there a little bit to get to myself right. Many of you know in here, the people in the tabernacle knows what was go- that she had it. I said... Then I say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that tumor shall leave her. It didn't bother her so bad. She'd been in bed for three or four days with it. I said, they will never even find a trace of it. For the Lord my God, who is creator, who can stop winds and storms, who can rebuke the seas and bring forth out. He's the creator of heavens and earth, and I love him and believe him. And I believe that this time is now nearing When these things are to be and you who could create a squirrel and put it into existence can take an enemy out of existence. I said when the devil wrapped himself in the storm, the winds is God's creation, the water is God's creation, but the devil got into it. That's what did it and put a a spasm in the sea like that. I said you could calm it and you that could calm that can take away the tumor from my wife. And I say that it is done right now. Never shall it be found anymore. It's finished. I went out of there with the assurance, told my son and daughter-in-law, we come on down. Last night I ran here real quick to have the meeting, went back, called her, and she knew nothing about it yet, I didn't tell her. And when she called, she was just all happy. She said, Billy, I got something to tell you, honey. She said, there isn't one sign of tumor left, nowhere the doctor said he couldn't find a thing. She said, and I was so happy, Mrs. Norman and many of the sisters here, two or three of them was with us here in the room. She said, the doctor said, and you mean to say, I can't understand. A month ago was a tumor that had the size of a grapefruit and said, Mrs. Brown, rest assured there's not one sign of tumor about you nowhere. So Lord our God. A Thanksgiving Day. Oh, thank God for the gift of Jesus Christ, that supreme gift. That is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is true. I don't believe in taking oaths by the heavens or by the earth or nothing else. But with the Bible of my heart, and God whom I love knows that every word of that is solemnly the truth. Thanksgiving Day. When I thought tomorrow, I had, or the next few days, I might have to even leave the meeting to go. Couldn't even promise the people that I would be back at Christmas time at home for my children to bring them back home again for Christmas. Knowing, quivering down my heart that an operation waited my wife with a tumor the size of a grapefruit. 
There it was in the very word of God that said, Say what you will and it'll be that way. And I said, The tumor is gone. They'll never find it no more. It's gone today. And the best surgeon, best doctors there was in the staff at Tucson, Arizona. When a few days ago, there was a great, a great big tumor like that. And the same doctor could find no trace of it all. And wrote out a free statement like this that Miss Brown has no sign of tumor nowhere at all. Oh, thanksgivings to God. This is a day of thanksgiving to me. To know above that that someday that little face that I married there, glory to God, someday these old age marks of death will fade away and I will be there in the likeness of youth and never no more to get old in the gift of God through Jesus Christ of the Holy Ghost that we have received now. It's what gives us this, this anchor. Look at it today, friends. You talk about a thankful people. We ought to be the most thankful people of everybody in the world. Besides the healing, besides these things that's taking place, what is it? It's the absolute assurance that the same God, by the same nature, the same pillar of fire, the same angel of God, the same Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever, He's doing the same things by the same power, through the same name. What an anchor of the soul, steadfast and sure. May the Lord God of heaven richly bless you, everyone. Let us bow our heads. Lord, I am so grateful, Lord. I don't know what to say. I just can't express it. When that hymn was sang a while ago, then people singing that song, uh, I, in my heart is jump for joy. And the testimony come upon my heart. Now, Heavenly Father, Thou knowest these things are true. Thou knowest in the depths of my heart that, and, and that it is the truth. I have no reason, Lord, to tell nothing but that which is right. And I pray, God, that today uh, may my heart feel to see all these Christian brothers and sisters here who are my brothers and sisters in the bonds of Christ Rejoice with me with thanksgiving for my little companion of a spare. And let me alone. Let me praise God. Let nature praise God. Let all that's got breath praise God and be thankful for this great time we have. Dear Heavenly Father, there I see there's a little boy sitting here in a wheelchair. There are others in here who are sick and needy. And just as you're the God of salvation for our souls, you're the God that heals all of our diseases and our afflictions. And you're still, with these testimony, just one or two, when they rank into the thousands that your humble servant has seen you perform and do without one blemish in it anywhere. And we know that you're still Jehovah Jireh, and you have already provided the sacrifice for the healing. The very God that removed that tumor out of my wife's side. You're just as much God right here in Shreveport as you are in Tucson. And yet I was miles, 2,000 miles from her at the time. I pray God that your holy presence will fill this tabernacle today with healing power that will heal every sick person that you that these thanksgiving blessings might continue to ring out back and forth across the country, Lord, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Grant it, eternal God. Now as you people are sitting here, put your hands over on one another and pray. Connect yourselves together by unity of faith in the presence of God. And remember that each one of you are privileged. God will judge me whether I've told you the truth or not. Has it ever failed? Have I ever told you anything but what happened? As Samuel said that time, that's when he's going to make a, a king, Saul. He said, Have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord will that come to pass? Have I ever begged you for your money, for my food? No, Samuel. But we still want the king. We still want our own earthly king, and Samuel knew that God was our king. I tell you this morning, folks, 
I'll bring you to record. Have you ever seen the gift of God fail one time? And we read about this morning. No, sir, it's Jesus Christ that can't fail. Science has proved it. The church knows it. And he's here right now, right at this minute. He's here. And the only thing it likes is for your faith to pick up that word and anoint it to yourself. And he'll heal you. And with your hands on one another, cry out to God with all your heart. Say, Lord, God, creator of heavens and earth, you can stop the storm. 2,000 years ago, you did it and you do it again right now. And you stop my sickness. You make me well. I'm grateful in my heart for you, the almighty God.